I can think of worse things than selling chocolate for a living, especially this time of year. That's why this week on Game Face Execs, it's a treat to interview Brian Bucciarelli, a sweet salesperson if there ever was one, not just because Brian works for Hershey Entertainment and Resorts in Hershey, Pennsylvania, the sweetest place on earth, but because of the way he tends to the rich history of Milton S. Hershey, the man who raised the bar, the chocolate bar, to create a company, build a town, and grow a philanthropy that is a part of Americana as, well, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup and the Chocolate Kiss. I'm here with Brian Bucciarelli, who is uh, a critical part of Hershey Entertainment and Resorts. Um, Brian, you have been with the organization for 22, going on 23 years. Yes. Who does that anymore? Right. I mean, most most of the people listening and watching this are probably either in between jobs or they've jumped from one job to the next. And that's not a criticism. It's just kind of a kind of an observation of today's market and how people go in their, within their career. But you're very unusual. You started with the company straight out of school. You're still with them. You have a major, major role to play. Tell us that story. Well, as you well know, Rob, you've been here. So I guess the easiest thing for me to say why I'm here so long is the story itself. And that's the story of Milton Hershey and Hershey and uh, everything about uh, the past and what he did to create the town and everything, our, our company, the park, the chocolate company. So that's the, that's the easy answer why I stayed there. Uh, the other parts of that answer is the people uh, and the industry. I fell in love with the, started out in the sponsorship world. So I fell in love with the sponsorship industry and then sales itself and then it transpired into premium seating and season tickets and groups and being able to do it <clears throat> actually in my hometown is is just another benefit so i think all of that combined was what kept me here for so long and you're right especially in the sports world you don't see much of this at all uh and that's not a bad thing i mean people go for jump for different opportunities uh, i was lucky enough to have those opportunities right here at hershey uh are there many people like you within the company Yes, more so there's a, uh, we have the uh, traditional form of folks that have been here. We have some people here 50, 50 or so years. Uh, and we have people, uh, we have some new blood. And I think it's, it's you know, in the, in the past when I first started, it was a lot of um, people that have been here a while. And you get that, that thinking of, um, we've always done it this way. So, I mean, that's, that's not always a bad thing. But I think having, the, having that mixed blood of people who are new and coming to us from other organizations with new ideas I think has really allowed us to, to, to go where we are right now. So Brian, kind of peel back, if you will, or let's, let's unwrap the chocolate a little bit about Hershey, all right? Because uh, those who have not been to the market and those who have not been to the park, uh, who haven't been to a Hershey Bears hockey game, uh, of course, the Hershey Bears are with the American Hockey League, a longstanding franchise. It's been there for decades. Mm -hmm. um, but for those who haven't enjoyed or experienced a visit to Hershey, just describe for us a little bit about this, this community and the culture and what it means to the people who live there and work there, such as yourself. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's called the sweetest place on earth, and that is trademarked for a reason. And the town was, uh, as they say, the town was built on chocolate, and that was Milton Hershey. Uh, starting, you know, just being a persistent man, he he went he went uh, bankrupt a couple times before he he found his niche in chocolate uh, in Hershey and Dairy Township, as it was called, and and uh, um, you know started his, his, his real claim to fame is when he actually added milk to chocolate, is how he got successful. Believe it or not, he's the one that started milk chocolate, which is why you see a lot of dairy farms around here now. Um, but uh, you know, from that came. Uh, Hershey Entertainment and Resorts, which is where I work, which is the, uh, uh, I don't want to, I call it the fun part of it, which is the amusement park. We have two resort destinations. We have a country club. We have a camping resort. We have an outdoor stadium that hosts concerts. We have an indoor facility where the Hershey Bears play. Um, and he really started not, I mean, obviously all that wasn't there, but he started that as a, as kind of an, a recreation place for his employees. He, that's, how he, that's how he built the park, was for employees only. Um, and then it turned into an, this some great amusement park. Uh, we are owned by the Hershey Trust, which owns the chocolate company, as well as the oversees the Milton Hershey School, which is the other great, great story of Milton Hershey and founding this at, at you know, originally was a school for 
uh, for boy for orphans, but you know, just boys, and it turned into now underprivileged children. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's what this town is built on, but it's what this town does and what this town off, offers is amazing. I mean, the, the summer concerts, U2, uh, Rolling Stones we've hosted. So it's, it's, a, it's a major market for Live Nation. Uh, the Giant Center seats 10,500 people. We do your, you know, your typical indoor shows. But like, as you said, we have the Hershey Bears, which have been around for 85 seasons. It's the oldest continuously operated franchise in the American Hockey League. Uh, and as Gordy Howe said, once said, anybody who's anybody in hockey play, has played in Hershey. So it was kind of a, a area where, where all these minor hockey league people came through to get to the NHL. Uh, we have Hershey Park Arena, which, you know, as we all know, the not only the Hershey Bears and not only <clears throat> Milton Hershey built that in 1936, I believe it was, but the claim to fame there is that's where Will Chamberlain scored his 100 points. And they all, now, and, and uh, the unfortunate part about this news now that it's in the news, it's also where... Kobe Bryant won his state championship in high school basketball, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and why that's significant now is a sad story, but it, it is a, another place where it made Hershey Park Arena so great. But uh, the town itself, and, and as you mentioned, you know, for those who haven't been there, I, I ask everybody, please, to come to Hershey and visit. Uh, Rob has been there a couple times, and um, it is a, it's just a great, great area and just a great, great story. Well, I've not only been there a couple of times, Brian, but after my first visit, I was uh, convinced that I, if I was coming back, and thank to you, thanks to you, I was coming back, I had to bring my wife. Right. right? And so, and, and you and your staff, uh, very hospitable, and that's the Hershey way, um, you ensured that when I did bring my wife, and I don't bring her on every trip that I take, and she doesn't want to go on every trip that I take, right. uh, but uh, I, I chatted with her about that just the magic found in Hershey and the, um, the mood that's there and the culture. And so we actually celebrated her birthday recently in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And thanks again to you. It was a fantastic trip. Sure. And there was more to do than we had time. Um, that's what so people don't realize too. They don't realize what, the, what they, you know, they think truly some people think of as cow pastures and farms and fields and don't understand. I mean, there was a reason for all that. that. It has that. Yeah, there's a reason for all that. Right. But yeah, it's much, much more. Well, what, what do you think uh, b besides that, what are some of the misconceptions people have had about the company that you work for over the years? Well, I mean, the, the funny one is uh, the biggest misconception is that our company produces the chocolate, which we don't. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are the entertainment side of things. We are, we are not, we are a private company. The Hershey company, which, pr which produces the chocolate is a public company. We are two, two separate companies owned, uh, by the same ownership group, the trust company, as I said. However, in saying that, our branding is chocolate. If you come, as you well know, you, you came to our resort properties, it's chocolate. Our park is a theme park, but it's chocolate themed. Um, so it's, it's uh, we, are, we very much live off of that, but we are two separate companies. But the biggest misconception really is that we are the, we are the ones that make the chocolate. Yeah. Well, one of the things I also learned uh, for those for those chocolate fans uh, watching or listening right now, is that you also own Reese's, yes, uh, which is an interesting story because the founder of Reese's, the Reese's family or the Reese family, if, mm -hmm. I, if I'm not mistaken, um, actually came from Hershey, right? Mm -hmm. He was employed by Mr. Hershey, and then he broke away and started his own thing, and then years and years later, they became part of the Hershey family. Is that right? Yeah, it's and it's the the factory's in Hershey, and it's just yeah, it's 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 a it's a weird twist on all of this that you think it was part of the Milton Hershey to begin with because of where it is, but it really wasn't, and it's probably my favorite candy. The recent <laughs> chocolate cups is probably my yeah. favorite. Candy. Truth but, be told, yeah. Uh, by the way, the Hershey chocolate store at the Hershey Museum, um, I've never seen anything like it. Right, yeah. you see variations and sizes of Hershey candies. Yeah. I didn't know existed. So five pound chocolate bars. Yeah, you can get, yeah, you can, you'll certainly get your fill of chocolate if you come here. That's right. Now, um, you're an entertainment company. Mm -hmm. You uh, attract people regionally, nationally, globally. Uh, and when I think of international entertainment companies, you know, I think of Disney, I think of Universal. So, how, from a sales, a marketing, a promotion standpoint, how do you compete in that space? Well, uh, to back up a bit, we, we, I mean, we, we, we have had people from all around 
the globe, but I mean, globally, nationally, yes. We've, uh, I know one summer, uh, we actually had uh, representation in our amusement park, a zip code from every state in the country. So we do nationally, yes. Globally, we do get people from out, out of the country every now and then. Um, I, I just think, I, I really do, I go back to think, you know, you always say it's a service, uh, you experience that, it's a, it's a, but, that's, but people have to get here first to experience the service, right? So it's how do we get people here? I think it's a story. I just think it's the story of Milton Hershey and what he did and what he created. And then you get here and you, and, you know, you bring a family and you're immersed in chocolate. We have, uh, I don't know that you got to see them. Maybe you did. I'm, I'm not sure, Rob, if they were at the resorts or not, but we have chocolate characters that roam around and, you know, you can, you can hang out with Mr. Twizzler or you can, you know, those types of things. So I just think, I really think it's the story. And then once you get folks here and, and we've, we have thousands and thousands of correspondence and letters from folks who, you know, they come here every year with their family. They've been coming for 30, 40 years to come to Hershey and the experience is fantastic. And just the level of service that we have is, is second to none, I believe. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, our, our, one of our biggest markets is New York and uh, we, we can constantly get people from there. So, I mean, we, we have local, you know, we truly have local amusement parks that we compete with. And if you go on the, the stadium side, uh, Concerts, yeah. I mean, there's some venues we compete with and the Giant Center as well, some indoor venues we compete with. But I just think the area we're in uh, also helps us. Central Pennsylvania, um, you know, an hour and a half from Philly, an hour and a half from uh, Baltimore. We are three and a half from New York, two from Washington, D.C., six from Boston. So it's just it's called Central Pennsylvania for a reason. And where it's located, there's easy access uh, to Hershey from all of these different areas. Um, we have also, yeah, uh, we have an airport as well where, where folks can fly in and we're literally 12 miles from the airport. So it's not that far. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, but I, at the end of the day, I just think it's, it's people were just uh, intrigued with the Milton Hershey story and what he created here. Well, and we won't take time. We can't take time on this podcast to talk about that story. Uh, but it's, it's found everywhere within the community. Uh, you go to the museum, you stay at the hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, his story is, is on video. It's on plaques. It's, uh, it's truly inspiring. And, you know, one of the th small things that people don't know about Mr. Hershey and his wife is that they were never, never able to have children. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, their children became the orphans of the community and the surrounding communities. And for him to fund their education, uh, what a legacy. And I think from an outsider's point of view, that's probably the thing that I was most impressed about, not that it was impressive to me, but how you and your staff, you and your team, it seemed to be the thing you were most proud of um, is that legacy of, of taking kids, underprivileged kids from all over the country now and giving them a quality education. Well, and you and Rob, you, if, um, forgive me for interrupting, but you asked, the first question you asked me is why am I here so long? Well, the, the core, our, our eight, Hershey Entertainment Resorts, I almost said H-E-N-R, so if I say that again, you know what it stands for, Hershey Entertainment Resorts. You know, our, it, it goes to our core purpose, which is to add value to the Milton Hershey School. So that is our core purpose. What we do and what the Hershey Company does supports the Milton Hershey School and uh, all that they offer these kids. And you're right, they didn't, they didn't, Mr. and Mrs. Hershey didn't have kids and they started this this school and what it's turned into now is just an, an incredible, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're athletics, they're, they're competing at a high level in all their athletic, all their athletic um, uh, leagues that they're in. Um, kids are graduated, the graduation rate. It's just, it's just a remarkable story. And then the house parents, that's a whole nother story that where these kids live with, with uh, uh, volunteers for the most part that these house parents that live and with six or seven or eight of these kids in each grade. And, and that's how they, they get to and from school and they're taken care of, they're fed, they have clothes. Just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't do the story justice. I mean, I've been here a long time. I just don't do the story justice. We have people in our company who know the history much better than me, but uh, you ask why people have been here that long. And then why people, the new people that come and want to stay, I mean, it truly is our core purpose. Well, I, I would just add that, uh, as I understand it, every time I purchase a Hershey chocolate bar or a Reese's peanut butter cup, I'm contributing to that school. We are. And that's what, and that's, and we send, we have a dividend that goes to that school every year based on revenue that we bring into our company. Yeah. Uh, do you know what the enrollment is of the school? I'm going to get this wrong. And if anybody from the company sees it, I'm going to say 20, maybe 2,300, 2,100 in that area. And they're, and they're expanding. So, you know, now with everything else going on now, but I mean, they're, they're still expanding. Okay. So with all the goodness, all the sweetness 
around Hershey. Uh, you're a salesperson, right? Yes. You have to sell on behalf of the, of the entertainment side of the company and the resort side and the, the hockey team. Um, so despite all that, there's got to be some challenges. There's got to be reasons why people don't buy from you. Um, what, are, what are some of those, what are some of the top tier challenges or obstacles you have to complete a sale? Um, and again, it, it, as you said, it varies depending on what part of the park giant center stadium that you're talking about, uh, different things. I, I, and I think it's no different than anybody, anybody else in the sales world. You know, there's, there is competition around here for number one, disposable income, not just competing team to team, there's disposable income. There's so many things to do. And where are we going to spend our money is, is one of the things, you know, I, I like to say, and really in anything we do, we're selling fun, whether it's the park, whether it's a concert, whether it's a hockey game, you know, you're selling that experience as you taught us all too. you're, you know, you're not selling a ticket. You're really selling that experience. And I just think we have, uh, because of, just like I talked about where we are in central Pennsylvania and what's all around us, we have so many, there's minor league teams around us. There's a couple of amusement parks around us. There's so many other things that are going on. So I just, you know, that disposable income and, and capturing that, uh, where am I going to spend my money mindset is really probably the biggest thing for us. Well, you and I have talked offline and we've talked face to face uh, in your office uh, about the challenges that uh, we're seeing in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that this is a very fluid, dynamic situation. And, you know, we're really adjusting on a day to day, week to week basis. Do you see, can you, can you kind of give us a glimpse down the horizon uh, as far as how you're reacting to this and how it might be changing the way you go about doing business, either on the hockey side or the park side? Yeah, I mean, it, it, both of them, and, and especially the park, because that would have that would have opened in, in April, really, for springtime. Uh, we've extended tickets that people have through June of next year. Uh, we're extending season tickets. We extended them originally through June of next year, but every other day that we're closed, we're going to ex extend season tickets by the day. So just unprecedented things that we have have to do, and the, and the right things to do. Don't get me wrong, the right things to do. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, though, on the Hershey Bears side, uh, it is remarkable to me uh, we're, you know, we've lost, uh, we lost the last six home games because the American Hockey League canceled and we lost six home games. So we're going through the process now of this whole credit thing with the season ticket holders. Do they want to credit towards next year? Do they want to refund? Uh, it is just so, um, and what word am I looking for as I, as I am 55 years old and, and things leave my mind, I guess it's just so exciting and, um, promising we have so many people that have paid in full for next year already they just, they just want to get back to hockey and um excited about next year now and we don't know what's going to happen you and i talked offline a bit about what's going to happen with the hl but the fact that these folks are yeah you know, they just they want hockey back and they missed out and you know uh, unfortunately the bears are having a great season we were number one and you know who knows where they could have gone but i think things like that are just are are exciting for us and it just shows that people are just ready to get out and even with the park we, we are mailing out tickets right now and, and uh, we're hoping for a july opening sometime so uh, but people they want to get out and who knows what the park could look at look like this could look like limited capacity in the park we don't know uh we're still trying to, to figure that out but um it's you know it's really a balance as you well know it is a balance right now of taking care of the customer as best we can taking care of our company. And then also it's, it's, it's worrying about the future with these, with these clients too. You don't want to lose them for making a dumb decision now to lose them in the future. What, what have you done? You've, you've, you've saved money now, but now you're having to go out and find new business, which we all know the heart of it's the renewal business and, and any of these things. So um, definitely have to, had to do things differently. I think we're doing them the right way. Uh, haven't had many complaints on how we're doing things, um, but just un, unprecedented times and, uh, nothing that we sat out, you know, y'all, we all have contingency plans, but this wasn't in the book. So, <laughs> Well, you also have a, um, some unique challenges as the minor league organization, because you don't get uh, national exposure, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about you on sports center. Um, this was the teddy bear toss we had that with a teddy bear toss. I did talk about us on sports center. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. I stand corrected. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about the, um, the unique challenges about working in minor league sports and, and, and how that actually forces you 
to develop skills. Not to say that major league executives don't have to develop skills. Oh, what unique challenges or skills do you have to really develop if you're going to be successful in this space? Well, let's take uh, let's take the uh, COVID nineteen out of it. And just to say it's a regular year. No, the, the biggest thing is we don't have a superstar. We don't have Sidney Crosby that we're uh, selling tickets. We don't have uh, you know the big uh, the big uh, ticket strategy they came out years ago is these some of these home teams that weren't drawing, you sold against the visiting team superstar coming in. We don't have that. We have, uh, uh, we had some, you know, before they changed some, some rules, we had some journeymen people that played many AHL games that, that now were sent down to the minor league, so to speak. But we have, we have veteran rules now. So you can't even have as many of them because it's a developmental league. They want to develop the youngsters. So you really can't sell based on your superstars. Um, from a renewal standpoint, we have 80 or 85 years here. So people know the brand. They know Hershey Bears hockey, and, and that's a big selling point for us. Other than that, it truly is what you what we just talked about before, selling the experience. And, and that's what it is, selling the Giant Center itself, selling the in-game entertainment, selling uh, the history of the Hershey Bears, the 11 Calder Cups. The, I mean, all that's, that's what we have to sell. Um, now with – COVID-19, uh, and you, you and I again talked offline about this, we don't have TV money. We're, we're not coming back unless we can have tickets and sponsorship sales. It's the only way American Hockey League come back. We can't live off TV money. We don't have TV money. So the next thing here is deciding when the AHL can come back and when we can safely have fans in the arena and, and making sure that they feel safe um, and want to come back. And as I said before, the signs are pointing to people want to get back. It's just a matter of uh, when we can do that. So Brian, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, misinterpret what you're saying or put words in your mouth. It sounds like you have a lot of challenges in minor league sports. Mm -hmm. Why would someone getting into the sports industry want to work in the minors? Because I think it's like an athlete that wants to get into the major leagues has to start in the minors. Right. So I think you, I think you, you, that's where you learn the basic skills. And I'll say this, if you can sell successfully in the minors, you're going to sell and you're going to, when you go to the big leagues, you're going to sell. If you're not selling, if you can sell successfully without a superstar, and you told us your story, Rob, when you first broke in, it, it wasn't in the minors, but it was with a team that wasn't very good. And, you know, yeah, and I'm going to assume you didn't have many superstars if you weren't very good. So, I mean, that's how you sold and you sold on the experience and you sold uh, on fun, you, to, you sold all those things. So if you can do that, I mean, you're going to be a successful salesperson wherever you go. And I, and I also I like to go back to the story all the time. I talk to a lot of my friends who are in the radio business who, who grew up selling without, there's no base salary. They sold on commission mm -hmm. and, and they were successful selling on commission. And you, you know, you, you learn how to, uh, you, you learn how to make, you know, how many phone calls you need to make to get an appointment, to do a proposal to make a sale because that's what you live off of. And that, and that's, that's, you know, I think in the minor leagues, you, you, you need to start somewhere and that's where you got to sharpen your skills is in the minors. But in your case, you, uh, you not only started in the minors, you stayed in the minors for over two days. So yeah. there's a career, there's a career there. It's not just a launch pad, right? It, it, there is a career. Uh, it's not likely uh, like it's, it's, you know, like, like we've talked about, however, I think the thing, the other thing with me I didn't mention is just what our company offers too. I mean, I, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm overseeing Hershey Park sales. As well. So I, there's a lot more than just the minor league angle to this. There are other things I'm doing. Um, I did have an opportunity to go elsewhere. I did and things just didn't work out. And, and I came back here and thankfully the, the company accept, accepted me back. But um, yeah, I just, I think there's a lot of stuff going on here in this company, which, which makes it an easy place to stay. Isn't it also interesting over the years that you and I have been in the industry how minor league ownership groups recognize that they're, they just can't own a minor league hockey team or a baseball team or a lacrosse team. They probably, in order to be a more, a, a more attractive asset and also a more attractive place for people to come to work, they probably need to have their hands in some other things as well, whether it's the venue that they manage, operate, et cetera, uh, or they, they have another team that they're, that they're working in their in off seasons, if you will. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of um, pairing up with uh, other franchises to uh, if I've got hockey in the winter, I've got baseball in the summer type of right. thing. There's many models of that in minor revenue, leagues. Revenue coming in 
all types of the year. And also that allows them to package things too. You know, maybe they're packaging season tickets, they're packaging sponsorships, they're pack so it allows them to do a lot of those things as well. I, you know, you, you did touch on something interesting and, and I, I, it's something I should point out, which makes the job here, uh, I don't want to say it's always easy, but makes it easier is that we, we do own the building and the team. Um, there's some nightmarish situations that people are in where that's not the case. And I, and I feel for them and, and, and heard a lot of horror stories there, but yes, we do own both. It makes it easy and do our own concessions, which is the third, which is the third part of it. Uh, right. It was a huge revenue source for you in that regard. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, since you are a professional salesperson and you're a leader in sales, uh, when you started your career, uh, when you went to school, did you anticipate that sales would be your primary function and the way you'd make a living? No, I didn't know. I didn't. I mean, I, I got a marketing degree and I, and I, and honestly, I, I was a non-traditional student. I went back late in life. I, um, you know, I came out of college and majored in ping pong and foosball when I first went and didn't do so well. <laughs> uh, I don't think they and, do that at Penn State. No, no, they don't give degrees. Unfortunately, they don't give degrees in that. Uh, but then I, you know, I, as I got, as I got, and I, and I say this, I've said this story many times and I say this not jokingly, but I realized that I wasn't going to make a living with my hands. I, I, I couldn't build things. I couldn't do that type that I needed to get a degree. And my dad always said to me, that's a degree is one thing that some, it's some, it's one thing that nobody can ever take away from you. Once you get your degree, you always have it. So I went back late in life and, you know, graduated late and, uh, an opportunity for an internship came up with the Bears, which is where I, you know, had grown up here, knew the Bears, and it happened to be in the sales department. And I just, I just fell in love with it. I think, maybe, you know, I think a lot of it was my, um, uh, my personality, just you know, getting along with people and relationship driven, and I think that's what's that's what's really uh, helped me through my sales career. Is just the, you know, the, you know, it's one of those things, Rob, and I know you've, you've, you've talked about it before, but you know, the, you, throughout my career, 22 years, 23 years now, you know, I've been to clients, weddings, birthday parties, uh, so many things. And that's when you truly know that you've, you know, you've done good is you're, you're, you're going to things. Not, it's, it's not, it's not talking to them during renewal time. You know, you're, you're spending time at their house. You're going on vacation with them. They're coming to your house. That, that's when you truly know that, Hey, this is, this is truly what sales is all about. Well, it's really interesting, Brian, because you, you're, you're bringing to my mind this idea that, um, first of all, there's an old saying, if you're honest, you can have a very short memory. Mm -hmm. Because if you're honest, you don't have to think back now. What did I tell them? You right. know? Right. Um, and so if you're honest in sales, you can have a short memory because you just always know. I'm just telling you like it is, or I'm being genuine and authentic. The other thing you're bringing to my mind, though, is if you really want to have a long-term career, let's say with one organization, uh, those people that you're selling this year, you're going to see next year. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see five years from now. Mm -hmm. So the things that you're representing to them, they better be truthful. You better be able to deliver what you're mm -hmm. promising. Yep. Um, and you've been doing that for two and a half decades. And there's still people here that, are, that I've met day one, and they're still involved with that company. And, you know, I've, I've uh, uh, not so much involved in the day-to-day -day sales of a lot of things anymore. A couple of things I have my hands in, but not as much, but, you know, there's still people that are still there and, and uh, it's just, it's amazing. And, um, you know, I, I always, my, my run uh, phrase that I always use with people is uh, chase the relationship and the money will follow. You know, we all know sales, sales is, is commission-based for the most part. Uh, but people that go after chasing the money won't last long. And, and you know why they won't last long is because you're selling people things that they shouldn't be sold. And that's not going to last into a long-term relationship. And your success, the success of your career is based on your renewals and your relationships. And I truly believe that. And I, I, my motivation, you know, I started in this industry making $20,000 a year, no commission. Um, I was never motivated by the money. I was motivated. I was motivated. Number one about the company saying he's doing a fantastic job. And to this day, I live by that motivation. Hmm. I've earned, I mean, I'm, I'm making a good living, but I've earned that. You know, I, I, I didn't start out that way, but I'm, I'm, my motivation still is great job. That's what my motivation is a handwritten note from the CEO. What a remarkable job you and your team did on this. That's my motivation. Not, not the paycheck. Well, I, I just want to say um, you're my client right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
we've done work together and we'll do work together in the future. Yep. And I will just tell you that um, the same is true. I love to say that that's a client I enjoy not only securing, but renewing mm -hmm. because the client is friendly and the client is reasonable and agreeable. Um, and though I don't know if you and I have ever had any disagreements or differences of thought, uh, but when we do, they don't stand out in my mind because you and I resolve them quickly and we keep moving forward and keep progressing together. So you're not only a good salesperson, you're a good client as well. Um, because that, that personality just permeates all both sides of your work. Um, so I appreciate that. No, I appreciate that too. We certainly enjoyed, and I'm not trying to sell, uh, Rob and game face, but we've certainly enjoyed the, the two times you came in and, and, you know, it was, you're the only, you're the only sales professional sales teacher that we've ever brought back. So, I mean, that says a lot about you and your organization uh, and our sales staff got, got a heck of a lot out of it and they're still using that. And um, you know, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so Brian, as we wrap up, uh, I, I would love to get an idea from you as to whether it's industry related or whether it's Hershey related. Um, how will the industry be different five years from now in your mind than it is today? Do you, do you see something around the corner that we need to be paying attention to, uh, that we need to be diligent about? Do you see innovation or creativity that maybe we need to stretch a little bit more in a particular area, whether again, it's within your local uh, properties or it's just the industry as a whole? I mean, it's a great question during these times. Like how would things change with COVID-19? Is limited seating, is, you know, is, and you're in a concession stand line or you have to be six feet apart. Is everybody gonna be wearing masks? I mean, that's, that's the most, I, I think until we get through this and get back to some sense of normal to see what's gonna happen five years down the road. Um, I don't know. I, I just think this is gonna be a, you know, are we gonna go back to normal? That's another big question. Will we ever go back to the normal way of doing things? Will we shake hands anymore? Will we, will we hug? I mean, if I, get, if I don't get to hug Rob when I see him, I don't know what I'm going to do when I, next time I see him. Um, but I think it's, it's really looking now when we, when we get back to operating, what's, I think there's going to be great changes there in both the in, uh, sports industry as well as, you know, amusement park, theme parks, even in our resorts, you know. Um, but down the road, I, yeah, I think we're always having to innovate. We're always going to have to to do the next biggest and best thing out there. The, the Hershey, you know, we just built a a brand new coaster that thankfully that's about done, ready to go. But uh, you know, we're the, the amusement parks always having to innovate. What are we going to do? Uh, when's the, what's the next big attraction? What's the what's the next big food offering? Um, always looking at those things. The, probably the biggest thing, Rob, and and is this cashless thing is the biggest thing we're seeing now you go up there and swipe it you know swipe the we have uh pepsi stations now that you fast fill it you go up there and fill up your pepsi cup by yourself there's a there's a barcode on it so all those things now and how big is that going to be now with this social distancing i mean how how much bigger does that become that you go in there by yourself and scan and do everything yourself um you know our, our grocery stores had that for the last four or five or six years, who'd have known that that's the biggest thing right now going for them. You go in there, you can scan things yourself and not have to deal with people. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I think this cashless thing is going to be big. It, it was, it was becoming big now, but I think it's going to be even bigger with what's happening uh, in our society now. Very good point. And uh, you, you mentioned the coasters, by the way, at the amusement park. I just want to say for those of you who've not been to, to Hershey park, um, they got awesome roller coasters there. Uh, more than you might imagine. They take great pride in their coasters. This is our, this is our tallest, fastest, longest coaster yet. Candy, again, guess what it's called? Candymonium. <laughs> Candymonium. Love it. Okay, I have one more question. I, yes, sir. I should have asked this, but um, so if I wanted to work for you, what would I need to do, say, show in an interview, if I'm sincere, to be the candidate you choose? Wow, that is a great question. I know what I look for in team members. I look for self-motivated individuals. I look for people with great attitudes. I think people that come to the office every day, uh, you're in control of your attitude, nothing else. Nobody else can control your attitude. 
I look for team players. Um, now, do you get this out of an interview? It's hard to say. It, it's, it's just a, it's a tough thing to say. I, I'll say this and I'm probably giving away a secret in case, you know, God forbid, Rob, something happens that you have to come to me to interview to get a job. <laughs> uh, I, there's somebody that in our, within our organization now that I hired, and it's the, it's the question that I ask. Everybody asks that standard interview question, where do you see yourself in five years? Everybody, you know, when, you, when you're talking to me, everybody thinks the proper answer is, oh, I see myself in your role. I see myself. This person gave me the answer I look for every time. I see myself making more money for this department. And I just love that answer. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to get ahead. Don't get me wrong. I, I've, I've had many folks that have, that have gone on into bigger, to, to bigger and better things. But I just thought that was the type of answer I was looking for. Somebody that's going to come in here, get motivated, uh, want to do a good job, and, and want to make more money for the department revenue. But self-motivation to me, I'm not a micromanager and just people that want to, people that want to come in here and do a good job. And I also look and again, it's tough from the interview process, but I do also look for what I talked to you before, somebody that's not motivated by the dollar, but somebody that wants to do a good job, somebody that their, their motivation is me reaching out with a handwritten note or just calling them or their boss or somebody else within the company just saying, hey, you did a fantastic job. Somebody that's motivated by that. I guarantee you the money will come. Guarantee it. That's great advice. And it's, it's advice born from years of experience. Um, Obviously, that works for you. It's worked for you in your career. Well, I mean, Brian, sorry, Rob. It's easy. It, I mean, sorry to interrupt you. It's easy for me to say had I just landed in this role, you know, making a good living and having to had to to uh, uh, start where I did and, and make those comments. But it's I started where I told you what I made, no commission when I first came up, and that got me. Through, you know, I was motivated by doing a great job, and that led to this, led to this, led to this, led to this. Yeah, I know it, it very much mirrors something that I try to share with uh, job seekers or people young in their career. And that is do the best you can where you are today mm -hmm. and the world will find you. Mm -hmm. Right? 100%. You, success cannot hide. Pe people will find success wherever, wherever it is. You know, I've, I've had people who, and this is just great, especially in the sales world, I've had people who have been, uh, recruited by our clients hmm. because the deal of day-to-day -day dealings with them, you know, and they're, and they see how, how they operate, how they are, they're relationship driven. They have great relationships with the, with them. They're, they care about the the, the client, not, not the dollar. And hmm. I've had people recruit them. You know what? I don't, and, and, you know, the, the client came to us first and I have no problem with it. It's, it's going on to bigger and better things. It's, I think it's fantastic. That, that just says a lot about, you know, it makes you feel good that this, this person grew up within your department has gone on to, to something else and they're happy. Yeah. Well, good advice. Great advice, Brian. Um, so I just want to reiterate to everybody, there get to go. Hershey, right? That's right. I was not paid for this appearance, by the way. This was, it was <laughs> voluntary. Join, join uh, all the great things that, uh, that Hershey has to offer Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, you can look up Brian. I'm sure that, uh, He'll, he'll take good care of you, if not him, uh, his great staff. You absolutely will. Get to Hershey, please. And yeah. if, you, uh, if you all out there haven't worked with Rob and his group, please do. Please look <laughs> into it. Honestly, I'm not saying, again, it wasn't paid and this wasn't scripted. Uh, best trainer, best sales training we've had uh, my 23 years here. So thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, it's great to visit with you. Thanks for all your great wisdom, Brian. And uh, good luck uh, as you work through the rest of the year. You too. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of this episode of Game Face Execs. If you found any of it useful or helpful, please rate or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I always appreciate you referring us to others as well. I'll see you next week. Until then, persuade, influence, inspire.